Hi everyone. Apologies for the lack of uploads recently. I've just been a bit busy. But when I acquired this, which is the motor from a Jaguar I-Pace, I just knew I had to do a video showing it. So I first spotted this motor just sat on the ground outside where I'd been testing the new Formula Student motor. It was a bit dirty and looked like it had been there for quite a while, but I just had to ask if I could have it, and amazingly, they said yes. So after popping it in a big blue box and lugging that into my car, I brought it back home and it's been sat on my floor for a few weeks. But yesterday, I finished my final exam for this year, so I thought as a treat, I'd take a look at this. Now, it normally comes as a complete unit with a large planetary gearbox on the front of this output shaft. And the first thing I did was just give the whole thing a bit of a a bit of a clean because I don't want anything on my on my table that's dirty. After cleaning it, I had to take it apart to get it to the state it's in now, and also to try and get it a little bit lighter to carry it upstairs because I think the full units felt like maybe 80 kilos is very very heavy. Now I thought I'd do this part of the video reps style because I didn't want to be talking outside. My neighbours might think I was weird or something. Started off by just blowing off a bit of dirt and to get the utmost video quality for you guys I lugged the motor over into a nice sunny part of the yard. Damn leaves. It's not the lightest thing this. I can just about get it off the ground but I'd rather not drop it so that's why I'm sort of tiptoeing it around. Hmm. Next I thought I'd try and undo this sort of cover thing on the end of it, which I guess gains access to some kind of fluid drain port or something, but it just would not come off. So then I moved my attention to the bolts connecting the motor and the gearbox. They did come off quite easily, and they had quite yeah. interesting heads. They weren't hex, they were, they were sort of... I'm not sure what the name is, but it was basically Torx, but male instead of female, like you'd normally get in a in a bolt. Uh oh. Unfortunately, that didn't seem to do much for liberating the motor from the gearbox. Next I, for some reason, thought I'd try and get the rotor out of the main motor housing. Mm -mm. So here I am undoing the bolts that hold the end of the motor housing on. Also removing a little ring bit. And you can see here when I try and turn the rotor, it just doesn't turn. So I was wondering whether that was an issue with the motor. Um, maybe something broke inside and it wasn't turning. I managed to get this end bit off a bit, but not really very much. But then, I had another go at prying the gearbox apart from the motor, and voila! Success! Hurrah! Ooh, that's a nice gearbox. That seems to be the part that's locked, because the motor now spins freely. Ta-da! Let's get rid of all this oil. Ah. ah, lovely. Let's put this where it belongs, in the soil. And I don't want you sitting in that. Next, to get the gear off the end of the motor, I had to try and undo one of those springy, ringy things. Very helpful. And I had no luck with that. So I turned my attention to the gearbox. I was trying to sort out the weird locking and I thought, what's this little thing on the bottom that looks like a piece of Lego? So I pulled on it and it undid it. That box in the bottom is basically 
the parking brake so it inserts a pin into one of the gears and that stops the whole thing turning. It's got a big solenoid inside which is electrically activated but just to free the gearbox there I think there's some kind of emergency override which is what I just pulled and that freed up the gearbox. All we need now is that motor in the lab which is easier said than done. And here we are, back in the lab with the motor on the table. I recorded a load of footage of me testing this and unfortunately that footage is no longer with us. But I can still tell you what I did. Now the kind folks who let me take this motor did say that it wasn't working so that's sort of why I've done a few checks on it. But I do also have a history of being given things that are supposedly broken and they seem to work fine. I started off by measuring the resistance and the inductance of the three connections at the rear of the motor which I would show you, but I can't really turn this around without damaging my desk. The resistance was too low to measure with any of my crappy multimeters, so I ended up just pumping 5 amps through, then measuring the voltage and sort of deriving a resistance from that. I ended up with pretty consistent measurements across all three windings, about 125 milliohms, which sounds about right to me. Possibly of note, one of the windings had a resistance about 5% lower than the other two. Then when I measured inductance, again this is using a very cheap multimeter that does inductance, so it could be miles off. I got 550 millihenry on two of the windings, and then just 250 on the other one, which is the one that had a slightly lower resistance. So it's starting to look like maybe there's something, something going on. When I was outside taking the motor apart, I did try and get the rotor out, but I quickly gave up on that because I realised the permanent magnets in this, I'm, I'm not really going to be able to get it out, and if I could get it out, I'd probably either damage it or not be able to get it back in. I was quite encouraged though that when connecting a 5 amp supply to each of the windings, the rotor did sort of jolt a little bit, which is always a good sign. I also did a back EMF plot by spinning the shaft with a battery drill I've got, and I plotted the output from my oscilloscope on MATLAB here so we can get a better view at it. It's not got very high memory depth because I wanted it to run fast enough that we could have a look at it. So that's why it's a little bit blocky. You can see how it sped up and then um, coasted down. I thought this might be useful. You could potentially work out the back EMF constant from this by looking at the frequency and the amplitude. Because in an ideal motor at least, this amplitude should be proportional to the frequency. So if the motor's spinning twice as fast, there should be twice as much back EMF generated by the rotor. So let's zoom in on a speedy bit to try and get a good a good look at the wave. And it looks quite signy, which is nice. The key thing I'm looking for is any difference between the phases, and they all look the same really. It looks like the orange one is slightly offset, but I think that's probably more to do with measurement than anything else. Maybe I'll take a quick look at a part over here as well where it's lower frequency. And yeah, if you ignore all the quantization noise, looks like a pretty good sine wave to me. So again, looking like there's nothing critically wrong with this motor. The next thing I did to test it is I connected it up to the three phase inverter that I showed in the previous video. Now that can get nowhere near this motor's full current or full voltage, but it can give out a three phase sine wave which is better than nothing. Running off the 800 volt system that apparently a Jaguar I-Pace has, I would expect this motor to probably have a max current of in the order of 250 amps and the beefiness of the terminals on the back support that. The limit of my current motor testing setup is 30 volts and 30 amps so not close to either of those really and if I want a current limit to be safe I can only do 5 amps but that should be enough to get some kind of movement which is all I really want. So I've got the inverter back here I'm not sure maybe you can see it there and I've just set it up at the moment for fixed frequency output and one of the knobs on the front just adjusts the frequency. Having the knob fully anti-clockwise does give zero frequency, so it's just a DC output, which is quite useful to just see if the rotor moves, and also I can adjust the power supply going into the inverter, and then I can see how much cogging I get on the shaft. So if I turn the inverter on and we start with DC output, you can see the shaft there jerk into position. I'll zoom in and show you again. So right now the power supply is off, I'm going to turn it on, put 5 amps through one of the windings. There you go, and you can see it jerks slightly. 
I don't know how well it'll come across on camera, but this is the motor with no current going through, and you can turn it quite easily. Once I apply a current, it gets a lot harder, and it also, you can see the cogging action. As the magnets on the rotor inside get attracted to each of the poles on the stator. And the idea is, once we add a bit of frequency, those poles will move around and the rotor will just move with it. There we go, there's a bit of frequency. Apologies if it's quite loud, I think the vibrations will probably couple through the desk to the microphone. And right now it's got no load on it except for the friction in the motor itself. And we're looking at about 4 amps at 6 volts. Do bear in mind my inverter is probably not running very efficiently at the moment. And also, the thing that's very critical and makes this quite hard to test is that because it's a synchronous motor, you really need shaft position to run it well, or some kind of sensorless feedback system which is a bit complicated. And that just means when I feed a fixed frequency in, you're probably pumping in a lot more power than you actually need for synchronous operation at a given speed. And it also means that the rotor will continue to spin at that speed until it gets too much torque and then it'll just stop. I sort of showed it in the last video when I was showing off the inverter but I should be able to increase the speed a little bit. And maybe now as well I can show the issue where if the torque gets too high it will just stall. There you go, it's stalled. And this is a very common failure mode, if you could call it that, for a synchronous motor where the rotor just has too much inertia for it to catch up to the rotating magnetic field that the state is creating. But if I give it a bit of a spin, I might be able to get it going. There we go. It doesn't have perfectly smooth rotation, this. And I don't know if that's because my inverter's output's a little bit dodgy, or I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's to do with that winding that measured a little bit off compared to the other two. But yeah, really, if I want to do a proper test of this motor, I need shaft position, which I can get using a resolver. And I do have a resolver, which you can see here. So this part goes on the shaft and rotates. And then this part is stationary and magic happens to get the angle. Maybe I'll explain resolvers in a future video. But the problem is, as you can see, this is designed to slip over the shaft and it actually fits inside my shaft. And that's as fast as it can actually go with the current code that's on my inverter. And I don't really want to change it because if I lose resolution on the knob that's controlling speed, then it'll be very hard to get the motor started in the first place. I'll do the same demonstration as before, I grab on the shaft and the torque will eventually overload it and it'll stall. It's also interesting noting that the current drawn from the power supply goes up considerably once it stalls. So right now at 14 volts input, it's drawing about 4.5 amps, which is quite a bit of power really, although judging by the smell of my inverter I think, I think quite a lot of it might be going into my MOSFETs. Increase the torque, and then, there you go, it stalls. And it's doing that same jerking motion. I don't know if you'll really be able to see it, but you can probably hear it. I'll turn that off before it gets too obnoxious. But that then hit the 5.5 amp current limit of my power supply and drew the voltage all the way down to 9 volts. So the effective impedance of the motor increases quite a lot when the rotor is no longer synchronised with the stator field. And that's mostly just because you're not getting any back EMF generated across the windings to reduce the voltage across them. I really want to test this motor properly at some point, so what I need for that really is a higher power, much higher power inverter, which maybe I have, and also rotor position sensing, which, as I showed, I do have a resolver, and I think probably a little 3D printed adapter on here might be able to make that work. No promises for when that'll happen, though, I'm afraid. I'm going to be quite busy over the next few months with Formula Student. Other things worth noting about this motor? As I said, it's got permanent magnets in the rotor. It's a permanent magnet synchronous motor. Um, it's water-cooled, of course. There's an inlet here and an outlet somewhere over there. And also, take a look at how lovely this gear is. This is the helical gear that lives on the front of it and oh, just slides on the front. So smoothly. It's a helical gear, of course, because this is a production road car and they don't want the beautiful wine of straight-cut gears for some reason. Unfortunately, I don't think there's that much more I can do with this motor until it's got 
some kind of position sensing on the rotor. It does appear to have temperature sensing of the stator. There's a little um, Deutsch DTM connector coming out the back with what looks like two thermocouples or thermistors connected to it, which probably won't be that useful because I'm not going to be running this at the 200 kilowatts it's rated for. I do find that really incredible that this motor can do 200 kilowatts and even skinny me can just about pick it up. Whereas, imagine a 200 horsepower combustion engine. No chance carrying that around the house. One moving part, it's... The simplicity of electric motors is incredible. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video showcasing the latest addition to my collection of large motors. And I really hope at some point I have time to make a little resolver mount for it and test it with a much bigger inverter. Now, I don't know when my next video will be or what it will be about, but I'm sure there'll be one at some point. Thank you very much to all the new subscribers. 700 subscribers is insane. And if you haven't subscribed, make sure you do. Thanks for sticking around to the end, and until next time, bye-bye.